Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today we bring you Bookshelf, an episode dedicated to the books we're each reading outside of book club, the ones we get to pick and choose. We're still in the thick of the corona crisis, and it feels like reading is more important than ever. So, what are we reading? Well, on my list, I have Exciting Times, the hot debut novel by Irish author Nisha Dolan, who is being much compared to Sally Rooney, Home, the moving memoir of young Syrian refugee Abu Bakr al-Rabia, and comic dystopia Early Riser by best-selling author Jasper Ford. And on my list, another well-reviewed debut, Such a Fun Age by Kylie Weed, The Hottest Dishes of the Tartar Cuisine by Alina Bronsky, which is translated from the German, Weather by Jenny Offill, and Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, both of which have made the 2020 Women's Prize shortlist. Keep listening to hear what we thought of them and to see if there's anything here to keep you happily distracted in these turbulent times. All that coming up here on the Book Club Review. Lots of books to discuss today. You have a few on there that I have heard of. Certainly Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid. Weather and Hamnet. Hamnet has just come out, is that right? Yeah, that's the one I read most recently. But I wanted to start with Such a Fun Age, although, weirdly, I read Such a Fun Age a little while ago, and I've been sort of almost procrastinating slightly about talking about it because it feels like a complicated book to sum up, but it isn't really. It's about this character, Emira, who's a young black nanny, although she's not really an official nanny. There's an important point. She's a babysitter and she works for this wealthy white woman, Alex, who is a bit of a social media star. She's got this Instagram online business that she's built up because of this thing that she does where she writes letters to people. She's very good at writing letters, apparently. And so she's built up this business based on that. And she's married to a TV presenter and they live in Philadelphia. But Alex pretends that she lives in New York because this fits in with her Instagram profile much better. And the novel is full of little digs like that, like tiny little observations, very sharp on contemporary life. And a stone is thrown at the window of the couple's house in Philadelphia. And they call Amira and they ask her if she will take their daughter, Briar, who is three, I think, out, even though it's sort of 10 o'clock at night, because the police are going to come and they don't want her to be distressed or upset by what's going on. So even though she's been at a party and she's been drinking and she's not really dressed appropriately for work, Alex says, no, please, please come. So she comes with a friend and they take Briar to a grocery store just around the corner from where the couple live. And what happens is a customer sees Amira with Briar and realizes from listening to the conversation that Briar isn't her daughter and calls the security guard over and says, hang on a minute, you know, what is this child doing with this with this woman? And it's a sort of racially motivated act of over concern for this child, I guess. And then what happens is the security guard comes over and Emira is confronted with, you know, why is she with this child? Why is she looking after this child? And where are the child's parents? And has she taken this child? And what's going on? And she completely robustly defends herself and says, look, I'm the babysitter. They asked me to bring her here. In the end, the dad is called and he comes and takes Briar home and smooths everything over and everything's all right. But then what then unfurls is this strange dynamic where Alex, the mother, is completely horrified by what has happened. And she's very fond of Amira, but I think to this point she's always regarded Amira as someone quite functional in her life. You know, it's very handy for her to have Amira on call to look after Briar. She doesn't really think about it too much. Just gives her some headspace because she's got another baby. And from this point on she becomes super interested in Amira, trying to ingratiate herself in Amira's life, trying to sort of gently suggest ways that Amira can better herself, and even sort of sneaking glimpses on her phone of what Amira's up to, like her social life. And then in another kind of strange plot twist, there's a guy in the grocery store that night who films the encounter with the security guard. And Amira afterwards says, no, no, you delete that. I don't want to do anything with that. And then later on, they sort of begin a relationship, these two. And then there's a plot twist where it turns out that this guy was actually involved with Alex back when they were at high school. So there's a sort of slightly hard to believe connection that links all these characters together and then from this point they're all just kind of circling each other it's well written it's full of brilliant sentences that really make you sit back and think things that really catch your attention and things that seem very poised and insightful about 
the dynamics between privilege and people who are working class, people who are just struggling to make ends meet, and race between white and black. Is it enjoyable? I mean, did you like it? Well, this is the thing. It's a <laughs> really you're... good read. It is. I mean, I missed a stop on the tube because I was so enthralled by the way things were unfolding. But ultimately, I didn't find it that deep, I suppose. It felt like a bit of a sort of a surface book. I thought the writing was really good. I think her dialogue was really good. Whenever I read an exchange between people, I thought, yeah, that's great. And the thing that kept me going through it was the character of Amira, who I loved and who just seemed really real to me and vivid. And I loved the interactions between her and her friends and her relationship with Briar, which was very sweet and moving. And on one level, one of the things that she's sort of considering is this idea that the babysitter or the nanny, the relationship they have with that child, and ultimately they have to move on. They're not the mother, and that's quite a difficult one to negotiate. And I thought that was quite well done. But at the same time, I almost felt like I've read it done better in other books. And there was just a little bit too much here that stretched credibility for me, particularly the relationship with the boyfriend character. And when you start to get into Alex's backstory and the reason that she might behave the way that she does, it didn't really ring true in a way that perhaps seemed more marked to me because I thought the Amira character was so great and so vivid and so real. And so then the other characters just didn't quite match up to that. I think it would be a really good book club book because it was an enjoyable read, well written, full of ideas, but at the same time, did it quite come off? I don't know. You know, I think there's lots to kind of pick apart and discuss. And I think you'd probably have a lot of fun doing it. Interesting. Well, that's a good prompt to turn to my debut novel that I read, which was Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. This only came out a few weeks back now. Nisha Dolan is Irish. And an excerpt from this novel was actually in the literary magazine, The Stinging Fly, which Sally Rooney edited. And Nisha Dolan credits Sally Rooney as a mentor of sorts, I suppose, even though I think they're very, very close to the same age. Exciting Times, then, set in Hong Kong, a city I have been to and loved, so that was a pleasure reading it. Mm. Ava is 22. She has left Ireland using, and I really was shocked by this, I had to text a friend to see if this was a thing, her abortion fund. Basically, she saved up money as a young woman in case she needed to have an abortion would have to travel to England. And is that a and thing? My friend from Northern Ireland didn't know, although you can sort of see how it could be just in case. Or it might be a very dark joke. Not sure. This novel is incredibly wry. The comparisons to Sally Rooney are fair. However, Nisha Dolan is very, very funny and has also been compared to Dorothy Parker. Ava is 22. She has traveled to Hong Kong using her abortion fund to teach English, which she has absolutely no passion about, but she just wants to get away. And one of the first people she meets is a banker named Julian, who went to Eton. And they strike up a friendship of sorts, where they're spending quite a lot of time together. They eventually start sleeping with each other. He has a two-bedroom flat. He's earning the big bucks working in banking. And she moves in with him, although it's never a relationship. They're sleeping together. She ends up packing all his clothes. She basically becomes a sort of kept woman. But it's this very ambivalent relationship where they are constantly verbally sparring, but he won't give her any affection. And equally, she is just quite mean to him all the time. Julian's bank then sends him back to London for a few months. And he says, well, stay in the apartment. So she's now living in her beautiful two bedroom flat in Hong Kong, not paying any rent. And she meets Edith. And Edith and her begin a relationship. I don't want to give too much away from there. But like you, there were some things about it that I just struggled to believe, not least that this is getting really pedantic, but Julian's a banker. At one point, Ava's looking up how much money he makes, and he makes probably 120 to 200,000 euros a year, which is an incredible sum. Mm. Nonetheless, I still couldn't believe that he would be paying for a two bedroom flat in Hong Kong with beautiful views for six months of the year when he's not there, because that would be a lot of money, about like 60,000 euros. And it wasn't and that the bank paid for it. No. See, that would have solved my mm. issues. Oh, Nisha, if you just put in that one line. <laughs> this book has almost no plot to it. So it is entirely character driven. You are very, very, very deep in Ava's mind. And it's a great place to be. Nonetheless, you don't feel for the characters in the same way that you feel for Sally Rooney's characters, where you're really emotionally invested. But on the other hand, 
Nisha Dolan is very funny. And I kept on highlighting passages on my Kindle and pinging them over to my friend who recommended this book to me because they're just so good. <laughs> I don't know if they'll come across as quite as funny as they are out of context, but just, just to read a few little snippets for you. So she's talking about one of the Sloney Pony lawyers who she has met through Julian at a party. And she says, Victoria had large teeth. They made it difficult for her to smile without scaring people, which is why Victoria smiled a lot. Later, Ava says, I wondered if Victoria was a real person or three Mitford sisters in a long coat. Mm, it's good. So it's full of brilliantly sharp lines. Brilliantly sharp barbs. Laugh out loud at moments. But we should care about the relationship, really, right between Ava and Julian and then Ava and Edith and then the three of them. And the love story that we have here never really came off for me. I just didn't quite feel it. But I would still recommend it because it's such a treat. The dialogue is so sharp. The writing's really good. It began to drag a bit for me towards the end. But if you love normal people, then Sally Rooney hasn't had a book out in a while and Nisha Dolan could be just the thing. Gosh, what next? Do you want to hear about the very off the beaten path, Alina Bronsky, the hottest dishes of the Tartar cuisine? I say off the beaten path in Germany where she lives. I think she's a very well-known, successful novelist. I think this is her second book. Her first book was called Broken Glass Park, and that was nominated for quite a prestigious prize in Germany. She's actually Russian by birth, but she lives in Germany, and I think this was written in German. It's a Europa edition, so it's translated from, yeah, translated from German. I read it because sometimes I like to make a little effort to read something in translation, because I think you know, we probably don't read enough in translation. Although, musing on this, I was thinking the trouble with things in translation is that I do always think there's a little bit of a cultural disconnect. And it's really rare to read a translated book that really bridges that gap. I was casting my mind back trying to think of things that I read contemporary things, because I was thinking historical stuff doesn't seem to have the same issue. But there's something about contemporary translated fiction that often it feels like there's, you know, in the way that when you travel, suddenly you're in a new country and, and, and the cultural rules are slightly different, you're a little bit wrong-footed, and there's a sort of sense of cultural disconnect. And I think you get that with novels in translation. Well, I certainly got that with this one. <laughs> so it's told from the perspective of a wily, domineering matriarch. She is Rosalinda. Her well-meaning yet dysfunctionally tragic comic efforts to secure financial stability, which to her means chocolates, stockings and a better apartment. She tries to declare her hapless daughter, Sophia, unfit so that she can raise her adored, strong-willed granddaughter, Aminat, and arranges meetings for them with useless, self-absorbed men whose only marketable quality is their foreign passports. A cynically humorous, compellingly honest glimpse of post-Soviet realities. It's really all about this main character. And she is a monster. You see things from her point of view. She's <laughs> she's just awful. It's really hard to describe how awful she is. I mean, when I finished it, actually, I put it down. And having read John Ronson's The Psychopath Test, I thought, I think she's a psychopath. She has no capacity whatsoever for empathy. And everything is calculated. So it's not that she won't do anything for other people or do anything that helps others. It's more that everything has to serve her own ends. And the relationship with the daughter, who she sort of describes as this awful lumpen girl, you know, she can't really bear being around her because she's quite glamorous and dresses really beautifully and makes a real effort with her appearance, you know, has the charismatic charm of a psychopath. And so this relationship with the daughter is tricky because, you know, at the beginning, you kind of take her side. You think, oh, yes, poor woman, you know, stuck with this disappointing daughter. But actually, as it goes on, you start to realise, hang on a minute, this woman is just a monster. Despite the fact that you can't help but root for her, just because of the way the novel is written, you really don't want to because she's just awful. And the daughter and the granddaughter, Aminat, who she adores. How old is the granddaughter? Well, she starts off quite young. It follows a what, sort of 20 year period, I suppose. So it's from when Sophia has the baby and then it takes you right up to when the daughter Aminat is grown up. And then eventually, Rosalinda does manage to hook Sophia up with a German man who gets them passports and takes them with him to Germany. But that was the point, actually, at which this really lost me, because the German man in question is basically kind of a paedophile. He doesn't do anything, but it's made very clear that his interest is not Sophia, it's Aminat. 
and he wants to see pictures of her. And Rosalinda realizes this really early on and deliberately encourages him and takes Amanat off for a very expensive studio portrait that she sends to him. And, you know, it, it, it was so bleak and so dark. And at that point, I felt so uncomfortable with it because it's still packaged up as a comedy. And it's almost like for me, it just went too far. Mm. I just couldn't read that lightly. Back to your point about translation. It sounds like the tone of the translation hasn't quite captured something that might have been there in the German. Very much so. I think it was really funny. And, And at the end, I thought if this was some metaphor for the Soviet system, and the people that it produces and the idea that in order to survive and flourish, you have to be this kind of venal, calculating type of person who will just stop at nothing to get what you want. And she's extremely effective and good at getting what she wants and, you know, organizing things. I mean, it's one of the reasons you can't help but admire her because she gets things done. (laughs) Ruthless. She's completely ruthless. And in a way, her impatience and frustration with all these idiots that she's surrounded by is also quite funny. But yeah, it was very dark. I was pleased to have read it. It's another one where I think if your book club wanted something just a little bit off the beaten track that is interesting and it is well written, it's got some really interesting ideas in it that are explored through this horrendous character. And it is very funny. I mean, occasionally I did find it laugh out loud funny. It's very good. But when I finished it, I didn't necessarily feel that happy that I'd read it. Mm, It's a weird way to sum up a book. I know. It's a weird way to sum up a book (laughs) that I I sort of enjoyed. But at the end, really, I was like, "Mm, Mm. I don't know. I was really interested to read her. And again, I just think in that way that sometimes difficult books can be really good for book club. I mean, there would be a lot to discuss about this. I will Um, congratulate you for your commitment to challenging reads. I mean, during this time. It wasn't a hard read. That's the thing. It's kind of a page turner in lots of ways. You know, you really want to know whether they're going to make it out of the sort of corner of Russia where they live and get to the West. And you sort of care about what happens to them all. So it wasn't a difficult read. But yeah, just uh, a curiosity, I think. <laughs> well, well, you've been doing that. Oh, oh, go on. My final point and critique of it is that I didn't think there was enough about the Tartar cuisine. So the idea that there's this sort of regional cooking, I mean, maybe maybe that was another one of the jokes. But then then the German man, the paedophile, the reason they connect up initially is because he has come to Russia to write a book, a cookery book about the Tartar cuisine. And this is her kind of heritage, her background. And so she summons up some sort of vaguely Tartarish dishes to cook for him. And and I thought that was quite an interesting thread. I wanted to know where that was going, but it went nowhere. (laughs) It's a great title. (laughs) Yeah, okay. it's an, it is. It's a tension grabbing title. Well, well, you've been reading dark translations. I have been distracting myself with Early Riser by Jasper Ford. Have you ever heard of Jasper Ford? I have heard of him. I've never read him. So tell me about him because I want to know more. Well, I had never heard of him, but he's hugely successful, like an incredible yeah. best selling author. But he writes in a very specific way. His humor is entirely British. Aren't they quite sort of self-referential, the books? Very self-referential. There is a lot of Douglas Adams in these books. Yeah. When you were younger, did you ever read the fantasy author Piers Anthony? No. Well, I somehow got into Piers Anthony when I was a teenager, like 13, 14. And I think he probably wrote 50, 60, 70 books. Wow. (laughs) And they were all fantasy novels, but really high camp isn't the right word, but just ridiculous and puntastic. And in that tradition, Jasper Ford loves a pun and he loves a fantastical world. And in this case, the world he has created is very similar to our own, except that for four months every year, the entire human population hibernates. Oh, right. This is a somewhat timely read while we're all in lockdown. In this case, four months a year, everyone hibernates except for the winter consuls who have to stay out and about and make sure that nothing too bad happens while everyone else is asleep. And so our main character is Charlie Worthing, and it is his first season as a winter consul. And somehow he has been sent to Sector 12 in northern Wales, of all places, which is where, well, Jasper Ford lives in Wales, so I think he's just sticking close to home. And Charlie Worthing gets into a real bind because in Sector 12, 
There's an outbreak of a viral dream. And among the winter consuls who are staying awake, people are beginning to go mad. So Charlie Worthing has been sent there. He's trying to find out what's happening. And if this sounds a little bit dark, it is incredibly silly. It is really well written. I do think that Jasper Ford has a really nice style. I don't think the tone is for everyone. And I'm not sure I would read more of his books. Though that said, he is very well known for his Thursday Next series, which again, I had never heard of, in which the heroine, whose name is Thursday Next, goes into books so she can jump into books to fix errors and pursue criminals. Oh. So she's a literary detective. And I couldn't quite decide if that appealed to me or not. Would you want to read about a literary detective? I mean, I guess it depends very much on the book she's jumping into. Yeah, and I get whether you know it, but yeah. then I'm I'm not convinced that I actually like people messing with the books I know and love. <laughs> but he sold 1.6 million copies, so he's doing something right, and know? certainly he has very loyal fans. Well, it sounds intriguing. I'm glad to hear more about him. So, you know, was it funny? If it was funny enough, I'd read anything. It's silly. Mm. Exciting Times is properly funny. Like, yeah. you really appreciate her wit. Yeah. It's so sharp and her observations are so spot on that you do want to send them to friends. Whereas Ford, it's just much more of a immersive, silly world filled with puns, quite left field. If you like Douglas Adams, you might as well try him. Hmm. Well, from that, which sounds like quite a nice sort of beguiling comfort read in lots of ways. Do you have more to... dark translations? <laughs> to Weather by Jenny Offill, which I also read before lockdown, before Corona. And I found it unsettling enough then, prior to all of this, and then it's just sort of haunted me ever since. So Weather is a book about the impending climate change crisis oh and, God. and the kind of psychological burden that we all have in relation to that, I suppose. It's told by Lizzie, who is a librarian. One of my favourite aspects of this book was her just doing her day job and all her little observations on the people in the library. That was brilliant. I would have loved more of that. There wasn't enough about being a librarian in there for me. More, um, more library, less yeah, climate change. Exactly. But that's what we all want. And that's her point. Who details her preoccupations at work and at home with a frankness that's often amusing. There are conversations with and worries about her husband, son and her brother, who is recovering from an unspecified drug addiction. She starts supplementing her income, answering emails for Sylvia, a charismatic leader in the climate change movement. The book is addressing the question, you know, how do we talk about and think about and try to answer the question of the climate crisis without everyone becoming totally desensitized or overwhelmed with despair and horror at what's unfolding before us? And it's told in little short fragments. Anyone who's read any of Ophil's other work and the Department of Speculation, it's very similar. That's just her style, these perfect little paragraphs or sentences, but it never feels disjointed. I'd love the way she writes so much. Really works for me. Because each separate thought leaves you something to linger with. And often they're very funny. The observations are always spot on. It's quite far reaching, like just a few lines, but suddenly it, it takes you off sort of thinking about something in a whole new way. And yet it's a very unsettling read because what she's dealing with is our inability as individuals to affect any meaningful change on what is generally acknowledged to be a coming crisis that's going to be far worse than corona. You know, we think corona is bad. I think people know this deep down. I think people know that what we're dealing with right now is kind of small potatoes in comparison to what probably, if things do not radically change, is going to happen in the future. And this is a novel that holds that up and examines it and says, how can we live with this? What can we do? And ultimately, it is unsettling because there aren't really any answers. She doesn't really hold out much hope for a kind of glorious coming together of humanity. Because I think people who are realists don't really see that happening. And again, it will be interesting to see with what's happened with Corona, whether that really does finally give us the impetus we need. Really interestingly, there was a review of this book on the New Scientist's website, which I just I thought was interesting. You know, it's not somewhere that you'd expect to see a book of fiction reviewed. Um, they said, Ophil's weather makes one consider the inevitable and accelerating encroachment of climate change on the foundations of what we consider normal life. It's a reminder that in a time of crisis, when climate emergency threatens to worsen into catastrophe, inaction is a moral failure. And yet, and yet, and yet, you see, you're looking horrified. He's looking horrified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny, at the time of reading it, I did feel really unsettled by it. I didn't enjoy it. But having read it, I think it was a really important book. And, and I think her writing is so wonderful. When I finished it, I thought, wow, that's amazing. She's made me read a book about climate change. 
which I would never normally do. Mm. Why would I never normally do that? Because I don't want to face it. And, you know, she's grappling with that question. You know, that's such an interesting and important question. And it's not something that we want to look at and it's not something we want to face up to. But at the same time, it's really important that we do. And if I have to think about something like that, I would very much rather look at it through her lens. Poetic, beautiful, funny, incisive, important book that's just full of really wonderful observations, which I do recommend, even though it's just not an easy read. And I think perhaps now, harder than ever. But mm. I'm glad I read it. I'm really glad mm. I read it. And it's not long. And again, great for book club. I mean, I think if your book club were willing to sort of go there, it's just going to be a wonderful one to discuss because there's just so much in it. There's so much there. Well, if the corona crisis has proven anything thus far, it's how quickly we can change behavior if we are forced to. And if just it is in our self-interest. When we all come out, we're just all going to snap back. And in fact, there'll be this real carpe diem. Ah, oh, great. Now I can do all the things that I couldn't do while I was on lockdown. And it'll be in some ways slightly worse. That's my fear. Oh, oh. Uh, oh. tell me. Tell me about Hamnet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back in time. Hamnet, Laura, is a book that deals with the death by plague of a young child. Okay, well, and it's great. Thank you, thank of, you. Um, Hamnet sounds super. That's it, that's all I need to know. It's my next bit of light reading. <laughs> God. Um, but it's by Maggie O'Farrell, and like Jenny Offill, I will read anything she writes about any subject because she is so good. Both of these writers have maybe read books that I wouldn't ever have thought I would pick up because I knew they would be good, and they were. So Hamnet could also be Hamlet. The names were interchangeable back in the 16th century, but on the first page, there's a note that explains that and tells you that Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, died of the plague, aged 11. So you know from the very beginning, before you read anything else, you kind of know this context. You've got this idea in your head. And also you've probably read the blurb on the back, which reads as follows. On a summer's day in 1596, a young girl in Stratford-upon-Avon takes to her bed with a fever. Her twin brother Hamnet searches everywhere for help. Why is nobody at home? Their mother, Agnes, is over a mile away, in the garden where she grows medicinal herbs. Their father is working in London. Neither parent knows that one of the children will not survive the week. Hamnet is a novel inspired by the son of a famous playwright. It's the story of the bond between twins and of a marriage pushed to the brink by grief. It's also the story of a kestrel and its mistress, a flea that boards a ship in Alexandria, and a glovemaker's son who flouts convention in pursuit of the woman he loves. Above all, it is a tender and unforgettable reimagining of a boy whose life has been all but forgotten, but whose name was given to one of the most celebrated plays ever written. Sounds awfully sad. <laughs> You've just been wallowing in the misery over there. I had ordered it because it was new Maggie O'Farrell and I knew it was on the Women's Prize shortlist and I just had ordered it without really looking into it at all. And it had a beautiful H on the cover and I was great, you know, lovely, I'll read this. And then it came and I read the back and I thought, oh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure this is what I want to be reading right now. And then slightly tentatively the other day, I picked it up and I started to read it. And she so brilliantly evokes this world and these people. I was thinking she's got Hilary Mantel's ability to create a sense of place and time by evoking how it looks, how it smells, how it tasted, how it sounds. But, but most importantly, I think the thing she does really, really wonderfully is how it felt for the characters that were there. You know, in the same way that now, if we walk into a room, we don't think nothing. We feel something. You know, if we walk into a space, if we connect with a person, we feel something. And, and she does that so brilliantly. And, and what it does is it just brings it to life and it makes you feel like you're there. It doesn't feel contrived. It doesn't feel like a, a funny tale about the ye olde medieval world. It feels like somewhere that you live and breathe. And, and I love that. There's this sort of heart-wrenching story about these twins and the one is sick and she's got the buboes and you just think, oh no, just awful, 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 you know. And then the other twin is trying to find help for her and it flips back and forth between this story about what's going on with them at that moment and then the history of their parents and their relationship, how they got together. And so you know that the father is William Shakespeare, but he's never mentioned, he's never mentioned by name. And the mother... Is he a character? He's an important person in the book. But he's not called Shakespeare. Okay. It's not, it's no, never, no, but does he feature? He he returns yeah. in London. Okay. Yeah. He comes back. Yeah. I think it's based on, on what's known of his life. This is the okay. thing. And then the wife is Agnes, who was we know as Anne Hathaway, but actually Anne and Agnes were apparently interchangeable. And I think the brilliant thing about this is the way that Maggie O'Farrell builds it around this character of Agnes, this mother. 
And it's really about her. And she's just extraordinary. She kind of has a sight. She's able to help people by sort of seeing their futures or seeing something about them. She grows medicinal herbs and she's able to help people with various medical problems. And she's someone that people come to for help. She's just an amazing person. And then her love for her children and that relationship and her grief. And I think the thing I thought was so extraordinary is, I don't know if you've seen Hamlet recently or as a grown-up. Most of us encounter it at school. I actually saw it not so long ago when I was going through a period of feeling very sad about someone that I had lost. And so I was in that state of grief. And when I saw the play, I had sort of forgotten just how how many people die in it. (laughs) But what struck me, like every line of that play, which kind of seared into my soul, was it's a play about grief. It's a play about grief. It's a play about loss. And if you're in that kind of state, you recognize that. I remember sitting there and thinking, my God, how can he have known this? How can he have known how I felt? Someone writing the 16th century, how can he know how I sitting here in 2019 feel? And then when you read this story, you understand she's, she's exploring this idea that this son that he lost, that's mm. where it came from. But you don't see it from his point of view. You see it from the mother's point of view. And, and that's why I think it works as well as it does, because it's sort of a woman's world, this world that she creates. And you're really invested in that. You really care about that. It's just beautifully written as well. It's absolutely mm. beautifully written. I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And I didn't find it harrowing, weirdly, very weirdly. Actually, <laughs> I found it profound. I found it moving. I found it relevant. And ultimately, for me, uplifting, I think, in that way that sometimes you just read something that's so good, it sort of soothes you somehow or enriches you. I do know exactly what you mean, because I sometimes feel I'm kind of looking to be entertained, but actually you can read something and afterwards just feel like it was a bit of a cheap experience. Like you haven't actually gained anything. It distracted you, but it didn't, as you say, it didn't soothe you. Yeah. There's a lovely FT review, Rebecca Abrams. I just wanted to read it because I just thought she summed it up so beautifully. She said, Maggie O'Farrell's exquisitely wrought eighth novel proves once again what a very fine writer she is. Hamlet is a deeply felt honouring of the warp and weft of life, the pain and joy that are inextricably part of human experience, the many forms resilience can take and the unexpected directions from which come grace and hope. And I thought, "Mm, yeah, it was so good. I recommend it to anyone. I should probably try and read a few of the other books on the shortlist. I'm feeling quite chipper because I've read two now. But Mm. um, I hope it wins because I just thought it was so good. And so unexpected. Like, why would you think to write about that? I love that. You know, tiny fragment, sliver of something that we know about from history. And from that, she sort of wrought all this. It's amazing. It sounds like it'd be a good book club book. And very relevant, arguably. Because there are these sections about how London was effectively on lockdown because of the plague. You know, really? when, when, when the plague was basically in town, that's what they did. They closed the playhouses. People didn't go out. And actually, that's right. when the playwright comes home to see his family. So, yeah, really good. Well, my final book, which I have read since the lockdown began, is Holmes, A Refugee Story. And it's by Abu Bakr al-Rabia with Winnie Young. And that attribution is both quite moving, but also a little bit misleading. Do you mean the with? Yes, yes, exactly. Mm. So Abu Bakr al-Rabia was a 10-year-old boy when the Syrian civil war really began to hit the city of Homs, where he lived with his eight siblings and his parents. Both his uncles and their families live in Homs as well, and they have a thriving bakery. And then the civil war breaks out, and they live in the middle of this war for three, four, five years. And he comes under fire while praying at the mosque. There are car bombs outside of his house. He comes across human remains outside of his doorstep as a child. And this all sounds incredibly bleak, but actually because he has his family around him and his father is this kind of incredible figure who will not let hate overcome his family. They're able to sort of rise above the trauma around them and stay strong. Now, just going back to that attribution thing, Winnie Young is a teacher in Edmonton and Bakar is one of her students. His family are able to leave Syria as UN refugees, and they move to Edmonton in northern Alberta in the depths of winter, and he starts school. And at this point, the story really ends, but we know, of course, that here he has met Winnie Young, who has helped him to tell his story. And that's why I say the attribution is a little bit, well, generous, because Winnie Young has written this entire book. And she has written it by interviewing uh, Bakar, but also by interviewing all of his family to tell the story. My mum gave me this book 
and it had been sitting on my shelf for a while and I felt guilty that I hadn't read it. And I thought, ah, well, maybe I'll use the lockdown to begin to work through my bookshelf. Mm. And as soon as I picked it up, I was incredibly hooked. She has a beautiful job of showing the love between this family and how they are able to rise above the violence around them. And also, you know, we think that when refugees arrive in safety, that that's the moment where they're going to become happy. And tragically, it's really the opposite for this family. You know, amidst diversity, they were a tight, happy unit despite everything. And they knew their place and they had a role in the community, even as the community was crumbling around them. When they moved to Edmonton in the winter, all of that falls apart. And I'm sure that this book and the success it has had in Canada has been a ray of light for this family. But equally, you have the distinct impression towards the end that they're all struggling. They're all dealing with the new reality that they have in Canada individually. And, the, and they've lost that close, close connection. And actually the extended family and all the cousins and the uncles, they have all been dispersed across the world. So they've lost that as well. Mm. And in his bio, Bakar says that he really hopes to go back to Syria. And I do think in the West, we often think that for refugees, the story is almost over when they arrive. And I think that's often not the case. And actually people just want to go home if mm. they could. If they could go home, they would. Mm. My mom read this book with her ESL book club. I don't actually know if I've ever told you. What's about ESL? English as a second language. All oh, right. Wait, how can your mum be in an ESL book club? English is her first language. <laughs> she leads it. So at the West Vancouver Public Library, they have book clubs for new immigrants who are working on their English. Oh, and they read a chapter or so every week for about six weeks. Mm. And they all come together to talk about the book. So yeah, my mum did this book for that book club. And it's really lovely. Oh, well, that sounds wonderful. That sounds like a slightly more uplifting note to end on than my sequence of books that get increasingly dark and well, self-destructive. Uh, well, up uplifting. Uplifting the power, I think, of the human spirit and of family. But equally, I think, a sad reminder that when you're displaced from your home, it's not so easy to pick up the pieces elsewhere. Yeah. We maybe should have choreographed the order of these because we started quite light, didn't we? Such a fun age, Jasper Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and then things took a dark turn. Sorry, I was sorry, thinking, listener. I know what you mean about diving into teenage reads during this lockdown period. Actually, I picked up a book. There are a few things I keep handy on my shelves that are just books that remind me of when I was younger, not things that necessarily I mean to read again. But I picked up a book that was um, a trilogy that I read and loved as a teen. And I idly pick one up and I was so hooked and I've been, I just powered through them and I've had such a nice time. And I've had this real sense of pleasure at just being taken back to that person I was, I don't know, 15, 16 in my bedroom, in my parents' house. <laughs> it's been very comforting. <laughs> That's exactly like me with Robin Hall, last book. Exactly. No, it's because you mentioned that. And, it, and it, it was funny. I didn't consciously mean to follow your example, but sort of subconsciously when I when I picked that up, I was like, oh yeah, this is real escape, basically to go back in time like that. I realized that reading something that you read at a certain period of your life, it's like time travel, you know, when you read it again. Anyway. What's the book? Oh gosh, would I, should I say, would I be embarrassed yes. to say? So no, go it's, on. It's a trilogy, it's by an author called Louise Cooper. I've never seen them, never heard of anyone else having read them ever. I was obsessed with them and uh, it's fantasy. It's The Initiate, The Outcast and The Master is the third one and they're great. They're about this brilliantly created world. There's this sort of magic circle, the initiates, and, and it's all to do with religion. There are the idea of these seven gods, the gods of order. They're in charge, they hold sway. And then there are the lords of chaos, the seven lords of chaos have been banished. And then it's about one man who comes to the circle as a child, and there's something different about him, something strange, something otherworldly, you might say. And uh, <laughs> he turns out to be uh, to be a chaos lord who's been sent as a kind of Trojan horse, and he doesn't know. And so there's this whole thing about him discovering his true identity and... Uh, a very tortured path he goes on. And, you know, they've just been great. I loved them when I was a teenager. I think they stand up pretty well, actually. Reading them again, I thought, wow, these are good. They're out of print. Are they totally? Yeah, what yeah, a shame. yeah. I'm Gosh, just looking on uh, Amazon. Maybe I should and... start a publisher to get the rights and start reissuing these things. Books I loved. <laughs> Books I loved as books a Books from my youth. <laughs> That's right. But then we could ask some other people. I bet there are loads of books like that that people just devoured when they were teenagers that are yeah. not in print anymore. It's all, that whole thing, isn't it, about backlist. Things go into the backlist and then they just drop, drop off, off the radar. The... Exactly. Anyway, yeah. Seek them out on Abe, all you fantasy readers.
Laura's looking really interested because she is a fantasy reader and she's thinking, oh, I've never read these. <laughs> I did Google them right away. <laughs> but, but you have inspired me. I do think that actually light, frivolous writing isn't necessarily what I need right now because I'm reading so much and I am reading for distraction. But equally, you know, a book like Hamnet might be able to do both. It could distract me, but also make me feel a bit more fulfilled, like I've done something worthwhile with my time. I'm fighting with my reading right now. It's just the same as it always was, really. I just kind of want the mix. You know, you read too much of the same kind of thing and it just gets boring. And just recently, I have managed to carve out slightly more time for reading than I managed to before. And then, yeah, it's funny. The books I've been diving into are, are, yeah, not necessarily the things that I would have thought I would want to read. But actually, I've been very happy that I did read them. That's all for this episode. We'll have another one coming soon. And in the meantime, if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email the Book Club Review at gmail.com and tell us how your lockdown reading is going. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? And if you like what we do, please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to us. In this time of corona crisis, when people need good podcasts more than ever, it helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, stay safe, read some great books and take care.